Let me move that just a little and then start. Um, now this talk actually started with a germ of an idea that was first presented here in 2014. And Matt actually recently put online that talk. I haven't watched at it because I can't watch something I did in 2014 on the internet. But um, I was like thinking about that and how I got invited to do a talk then and I had a list of like 10 topics and Matt picked this topic and it's like, you know that's the same topic. <laughs> I think Ryan picked it. Okay, well Ryan picked the topic. Yeah. But and I thought, well, I should. It's it's changed a lot because I've learned things in the last five years, hopefully. But also, um, I think it's it's actually kind of perfect to perform given the content of this lecture. Kind of like stack it on top of each other in time because this is a space that kind of works that way. There's all these elements of all these uh, nativities that have happened through the years, and we sort of have these uh, past echoes being carried into the future, and so this space becomes a place that um, is sort of resonant with all these ideas, and I think this lecture is one of those kinds of spaces as well, so, you anyway. uh, I'm gonna start with something I really never, ever do, which is show my own work. Um, so in February 2005, I had an exhibition at the Hadrian Gallery in Seattle University, and the title of that exhibition was Drawing God from Direct Observation, uh, and one of the <coughs> Jesuit priests who teaches at Seattle University <laughs> went, went on record for the student newspaper saying, I don't think she's actually talking about drawing God. I think she, <laughs> it was funny, like a student was like writing about it and then they had to be like, I don't think that's what that is because it was blasphemous, I guess. But it was nice of them to show it. And, um, and during this show, I actually brought in um, some, of, some of my drawings. It was kind of like a mini retrospective along with uh, videos and music, and then this sort of like small version of my library that, and a rug and my hand chair, and so sort of encouraging people to come in and interact with the work. And um, the, books are, the books on the shelves are like religious art, but also like outsider art, and a lot of different people who have sort of ch tried in different ways to you know, think about that question, like what does it mean to draw God, or what do we mean by God? Like what, what is this like, ineffable spiritual realm that artists sometimes interact with? Um, and so, like I said, the seed of this exhibition was a lecture I gave here in 2014. And um, I rationalized it by just including it now and making the lecture meta. Um, but in retrospect, this exhibition uh, signaled a new direction for my own practice, which is that this is one of the last times I had a proper exhibition of my own drawings and stuff. I will probably do that again in the future. But at this point, I was beginning to foreground the research aspect of what I was interested in working on. And I think all artists research the things they're interested in. But I started sort of drifting into where I am now, which is like going, I'm gonna go do this PhD for some reason. So, um, and I've never been very prolific as a visual artist, but here in the space, I think my, or one of my earliest pieces is like in the hallway. So you can see some of my like MFA work in this space. Matt is the custodian of this like stained glass window of advertising tech. So on your way out, you can see that. And if you know what I'm talking about, then you, then you know what that is. But then um, this is the first, sort of one of the earliest pieces that was in that show at the Hadrine, which is a uh, collage from 2008. And as you can kind of see that so there's some of this advertising text is still there. Um, but uh, it's, it's being combined with like Prismacolor and other things. And I was just kind of working on these like forms that are just completely formal and abstract. And they just sort of were like occurring to me, like I have to draw this thing. And I can't really explain why, except that I was also playing a lot of music. There were some other things I was doing a lot of. And uh, you know, music and visualization just had a lot of connections to each other. So if I was playing a lot of music and I tend to like colors and shapes just sort of started to come too. And this is from a year later, which I exhibited at the Seattle Art Museum's Rental and Sales Gallery, and it sold, and I was actually very sad, and I'm still sad because I don't have it anymore, and it's like sort of in this body of work, and I hoard everything except for this. Uh, and here's a drawing from 2014, and at this point I was making new work for an exhibition at Vignettes in Seattle, which was a little apartment gallery that no, is no longer there, but Vignettes is still active between Seattle and New York City. And I bring this stuff up because the process I was working with was very intuitive. Um, I was trying to cultivate a passive meditative mindset where the image would just come through me. And there were a lot of artists that I didn't know about yet. And then I started to discover them or people would show them to me. 
And I realized that their work already looks familiar. You know, it's not like, what in the hell is that thing? It's like, oh, that thing, you know? Um, so yeah, but why drawing God? Uh, well, that question is like, I thought that was a funny title, but it bumps up against what we mean when we say God. And I think uh, it's, it's interesting maybe to like zoom out and we don't need to say God, but we can think about like, what is religion? What is belief? What is this thing that we blow each other up over? You know, what are these ideologies that we, that are secular ideologies and how are they related to the sort of aesthetic functions of, of religion and art and religion together? So I think on the one hand, the idea of God can evoke the infinite, impenetrable wonder of all the, the creative and destructive aspects of the entire universe. Um, you know, the agents of particles, the, the agency of particles on the quantum level, if you're looking from a new materialist standpoint, there's actually agency inside of everything, and that's a really exciting place to think about God being, is inside of the universe and not necessarily outside of it. Um, and so what is it inside of a tree that makes it grow toward the sun, or inside the engine of libido that stirs the sexual desire behind the perpetuation of all this shit? <laughs> well, we can understand these things on a chemical or physical level, but it doesn't tell us necessarily anything about our experience of them, or our experience of experience itself. You know, this isn't a shortcoming of science necessarily, but it's rather a delineation of the role of science relative to the domain of philosophy. So on the other hand, both God and religion can be concepts that evoke visceral dread or revulsion for those of us who consider ourselves secular. Perhaps God is the domain of an abusive, patriarchal, homophobic church in denial of everything sexual, evolutionary, and truly spiritual about this gleaming, holy situation. And I think that response is valid, especially for people who grow up in like households where you have the really traumatic experience that you're trying to get away from. Um, but I also think that the reason for this experience has less to do with God as an idea and the ultimate signifier, perhaps, and more to do with the history of how the spiritual dimension, with all of its resonant power, has been wielded in the service of the political, which is what I'm kind of working on for my research. So this is Hammurabi um, on the left. He really looked like that. <laughs> um, and uh, he's, Hammurabi is a Babylonian ruler from the 18th century BCE, so 1750s-ish BC. And Hammurabi consolidated many of the surrounding city-states city into an empire with Babylon at the top. So, you know, it was all these little city-states and he was like, what if we made an empire? And uh, so this is the code of Hammurabi, which is in, uh, on a, carved into a steel that's at the Louvre. And um, this is kind of like the earliest example of like a legal code. Um, it's Hammurabi's new laws involving property rights, overwhelmingly regarding the rights of women and sort of other political and economic changes that were coded into law using the new medium of cuneiform. So, you know, writing happens and what do we start to do with writing? We figure out like, the, or some of the earliest writing is like receipts, like who owes who, what to whom. And then we end up sort of telling these stories about ourselves that uh, justify those, those relationships, those economic and power relationships. So um, in, in the epilogue of the Code of Hammurabi, we find references to the god Marduk. Now, Mar just as Marduk is the ruler of heaven, so Hammurabi shall be the ruler of man. We make an order in the heavens that mirrors what we're trying to do here on Earth. So who's Marduk? Well, Marduk is the hero of the creation epic Enuma Elish, which is called Enuma Elish because those are the first words of the, of the poem. It's not necessarily called that, but it's just what we call it. And in this story, you know, Marduk conquers the oceanic goddess Tiamat and creates the world from her body parts. Now, the Canadian psychologist Jordan Peterson has a lot of videos and books about the fact that this story is evidence of his conviction that patriarchal order is the correct and ancient order of the universe. Here it is in this very old story. Well, scholars of Enuma Elish see it very differently. <laughs> um, Alexander Heidel, who translated this back in the 1950s, basically says, 
You know, this is a story that was obviously written out of older parts put together. These parts would have been familiar to an audience, um, and, and we're using it as a cosmic justification for changes in a power structure. So this is a view that is corroborated through and through by later scholars who deal with this work. So what we have here is this pattern being established very early in the earliest days of statecraft and writing of molding and forming the gods in the image of what we want to be doing politically and using written language then to set those images of the gods in stone. Now this tendency is exemplified by the ancient Romans who absorbed the gods from the places they conquered into their own pantheon. So on the left we have a statue of Jupiter who was borrowed from the Greeks where he was Zeus and on the right, the Emperor Augustus rendered in the style of a god, you know, and his, his mantle on his uh, armor is covered with stories of like his conquests. He's slaying barbarians and female monsters left and right on his, on his chest. Now, according to Eusebius, during a decisive battle in 312 CE, the Emperor Constantine is said to have experienced a vision in which the cross appeared to him with the words, in hoc signo quinces, in this sign you will conquer. So through this sort of celestial branding idea that he had, um, Christianity, a religion and resistance movement whose leader had been ostensibly crucified by the Roman Empire for being a troublemaker just three centuries prior, became the property of the emperor, Constantine's brand. And just as Hammurabi had projected his imperial aspirations onto the heavens, the new Christian Bible commissioned by Constantine in 331 BCE reinforced a church structure that was imagined to reflect a celestial order. Um, Matt said this reminded him of my old hot tub. <laughs> and he's not wrong. Um, so the appropriation of Christianity as a state religion means that all the spiritual significance to the texts spanning several centuries and all the languages that made up this new Bible, um, from the Hebrew scriptures to like the Greek translations of the gospels and so forth, um, well, these could be wielded to political ends, uh, drawing a line between the saved and the damned and placing the institution in charge of maintaining that line. Now, pagan religions and their practices could be criminalized and eradicated. The burning of witches could prevent the accumulation of scientific and spiritual knowledge that might pose a challenge to the church's authority. From the accumulations of wealth, great art and architecture was erected, reinforcing the link between ecstatic experiences and the holy government. Given this context, is there such a thing as religion or art even that can be divorced from this political function? I'm actually not sure if there is, but I think that if we start our story early enough, we can perhaps trace some threads that have been with us at least for tens of thousands of years and which still surface like little blades of grass pushing through the concrete and will be our inheritance even as empires rise and fall, if we know where to look for them. So this is a photo of the interior of one of the caves at El Castillo, Spain, which is some of the oldest cave paintings on earth are located here. Now the function of paintings like these is ultimately a mystery, but connecting the style of imagery here to the known function of other similar caves in Africa and the Americas, archeologists have speculated that cave paintings were part of a larger holistic cultural tradition that involved magic, vision quests, altered states of consciousness, sometimes induced by sacred plants or mushrooms, and other techniques for making contact with the spirit world. And I've actually been researching uh, like Coast Salish religion and culture quite a bit because I'm doing a Seattle art history and I'm doing my lecture next week in Seattle. Um, but the, there's a vision quest that's very central to the heart of Coast Salish culture that people have a vision and they don't necessarily tell people what the contents of the vision are, but it um, helps people determine their place in the social order. And a lot of things sort of are dependent on that sort of esoteric practice. And sort of by nature, that's, it's a little ahistorical. You don't write it down, so it's hard to keep track of. So these are sort of anomalous in that we have this very ancient record of something that might have otherwise just been a very fleeting 
experience, right? Anyway, these red dots seem to outline part of some great invisible structure, you know, almost like pathways of energy resembling dots. Uh, and these, this is, these occur later, these dots also in more figurative cave paintings, uh, such as the ones found in Peshmo in France. Now, I love how there are both red and black dots here, both on and off the bodies of the animals, suggesting that both the figure and the space around it are filled with the same sort of thing. Are, are these particles? Are they atoms? I mean, is, are we reading too much into this? Uh, we, don't, you know, we don't really know anything about the people who made these, except that the history of science and religion as separate categories of inquiry is a very recent development in human history, traceable to, you know, as much as anything, to like Cartesian dualism that permeated the Enlightenment. But for most people, of course, throughout most of human history in most places, the scientific is spiritual. The origins of the universe and the forces of evolution are a sacred matrix of creation. Learning about nature means learning about the gods. Bodies are holy, the land was holy, is holy, celestial bodies are holy, you know, we know this because there are still places where this is the case. And I'm reminded here of a quote from James Baldwin, who says, there is reason, after all, that some people wish to colonize the moon and others dance before it as an ancient friend. So this is the Wounded Bison, a cave painting from Neo-France, which has contributed to the conclusion that one of the earliest contexts for ritual activity is the boundary between life and death and all the ways that that boundary can be fluid. This is an animal that the people would have been dependent on for survival, and the act of wounding it gives forth this life-giving blood uh, you know, not unlike the menstrual cycle or not unlike the life-giving blood of Christ, who is depicted, oddly, in the book of Revelation as the lamb who was slain. Now, you think about how we treat animals and then think about finding out that God was watching you all along through the animal's eyes. <laughs> uh, and imagine having a spiritual relationship to the animal that you depend on for food instead of buying it from a factory farm in plastic from Trader Joe's that goes straight to the ocean. <laughs> Not to call it Trader Joe's specifically, but they are doing less plastic, I'm sorry, I've heard these, these days. <laughs> um, you ever buy like an apple and it's just covered in plastic? <laughs> That's the fall of man. Um. <laughs> So another thing you can see, these handprints in Peshmerl, they also happen to be in the cave we looked at in Spain, El Castillo. And what we can gather from these hands is quite fascinating because it's evidence of the people who held rituals in the caves. It's a signature, it's a person's body they printed in there, you know? And in 2013, the archeologist Dean Snow published research analyzing the handprints in cave paintings in France and Spain by comparing the relative lengths of the ring finger and pointer, which on average are more similar in women than men. Snow determined that about three quarters of the handprints in the caves he analyzed were probably female. So there's a tendency when we're looking into the past to romanticize what we find, and certainly when we're looking at the past, we're always looking through our own biases and cultural framework and our politics. But as we move closer to the present moment, I do think it's possible to draw at least one conclusion from early human art, which is that the relationship between art and visionary states, or what we might call altered states of consciousness, are intrinsically linked. Here's oh, more, more of these hands that I forgot to tell you about, but anyway. So yeah, men and women, like a lot of women's hands in here making art. So these are petroglyphs near Moab, Utah, approximately 4,000 years old. We have a lot of the features that will come to us be associated with visionary art. You know, spirals, animals, a figure who looks part animal, part human, um, you know, maybe looking at us with those eyes of the animals. And these are rock carvings that are much later, from around the 16th or 17th century CE, in Dine, Navajo country made at a very different time, at a different place, which show continuity with those ancient petroglyphs. 
And it turns out, of course, the spiral is like one of these very nearly universal motifs. You know, here um, we see the Triskelion or triple spiral in Algeria in like caves from 10,000 BCE. And we see the same exact motif on a jug from Greece from, you know, around 1400 BC. So when you see something that shows up in lots of times and places, almost like a hyper object or something, you know, there's, there's two plausible re reasons for this. One is that you have cultural contact, like, hey, check out my thing, like, that's cool, I'm gonna use that too. <laughs> or, <laughs> huh? Memes, memes, absolutely. Um, you know, or you have many people arriving at the same conclusions separately. And in the case of the spiral, it's distributed so widely on these different continents at such an ancient point in our history that it's, you know, it's not unreasonable to think about it in terms of like human biology or like what happens when the brain is like kind of trying to see its own processes. And this is an in illustration from a book by the 20th century psychologist Heinrich Kluver, who experimented with mescaline and noted that visual hallucinations he experienced fit patterns that we can map onto art with a lot of visionary or spiritual components. Spirals, tunnels, lattices, and the feeling of sort of sensing this underlying framework or network behind everything, but also possibly the experience of seeing one's own visual cortex at work, analyzing and interpreting information visually and presenting it to the brain as something that makes sense. So such patterns can be mimicked or approximated using a camera and video feedback. Is this your image, Jamie? This is on my hard drive. You might have made this. I think it is. Uh, I'm sorry, I'll, I'll put your name on it. <laughs> So like if you're Jamie and you zone out with a video camera, like this, uh, you know, or if you're like Skyping with someone and then you put your phone and you're on the phone and you're front of you know, hey, hey, hey. Uh, you know, by pointing a camera of, uh, at a feed of what the camera is looking at, um, we can visualize the appearance of eternity. And this is an image from the cover of Douglas Hofstetter's book, I Am a Strange Loop, that sort of talks about this phenomenon in terms of how, uh, how like images in the mind are created through sort of apprehending something that sees something that sees something. And if you're interested in video feedback spirals, um, this is an image from a music video for my old band, Middeville Moon Temple, where I'm physically inter interacting with all this gear that's feeding back into space. So I'm like moving around making cave paintings in video. So there's also uh, through sort of the, the history of religious art a uh, tendency for the bodies of the gods to actually have this aspect about them, uh, especially in sort of Hindu and Buddhist art. This is um, on the left, this is uh, Vishvarupa, uh, a representation of Vishnu as re revealed to Krishna, sorry, by Krishna to Arjuna in Bhagavad Gita. Uh, he's, <laughs> Krishna's like, well, if you saw my real form, you wouldn't be able to. Take it, and he's like, oh wait, I want to see. And then he just goes, and he's like a thousand heads, and he's just like, nope, yeah, please go back down to just eight arms is all right with me. And, um, <laughs> and then on the right, uh, you know, we have um, Ananta Shesha, the infinitely headed serpent on which Vishnu reposes during the endless timeless period between creations of the universes. And uh, there's actually a lot of sort of theory and research around this. There's a book called Many Heads, Arms, and Eyes that's all about the sort of multiplicity convention in Hindu and Buddhist art and how it relates to the Vedas and how the gods are like sort of contain this quality of being pregnant with potentiality. So the gods are like whatever's moving through time with the p possibility of form, you know? Um, and so, uh, that makes a lot of sense. And what's interesting is like the same sort of like infinity serpent idea uh, shows up again through across time and space, distributed across cultures. Um, you know, oh, here's one more time, one more Shesha. Here's Vishnu reclining on the serpent. So, and here's uh, Hercules slaying the Yelernaean Hydra which is a literal fractal in that when you cut one head off, another grows in its place. So to me, I feel like the infinity headed serpent is one of these things you can look at and just know like, oh, okay, like this is something, this is like what, um, you know, Deleuze and Guattari call like an arborescent form maybe. It's, it's um, 
uh, it seems to contain all of these potentialities of like tree roots, coral, river systems, and sparks, like the one photographed here. And coral. So before she was a, a monster, the serpent-headed Medusa was an African mother goddess. So when Perseus beheaded her, you know, he's like taking that power away from her, but her blood is said to have formed the coral of the Mediterranean Sea, sort of providing this link between these supplanted goddess religions and the physical, physical earth, even as she becomes sort of an emblem of patriarchal militaristic culture. Also, the family tree or family lineage takes the form of the infinite serpent. If we think about our ancestors, you know, all of us, DNA inside of us has this sort of form. If you think about all the uh, sort of meta DNA, all of the like epigenetics, then um, it, it, it goes back and gets even, the cloud of information becomes even more profound. So I like looking at these two images side by side when thinking about God and snakes. Um, which is on the left, we've got an amazing painting by John Singer Sargent, which basically I feel like sums up Western civilization. <laughs> we've got a golden man trying to bludgeon the serpent of infinity. It's like, what do we got? Let's kill it, you know? <laughs> I don't know if I put it in this, but there's an image in the Red Book, Carl Jung's Red Book, of trying to cut uh, had, uh, cut limbs off of a serpent that's growing and like he realizes eventually that like the form he's growing is made out of the blood so he's just making more and more work for himself there's no way out except to stop stopping it um, and on the right uh, we have uh, Krishna who comes into conflict with a many-headed serpent named Kaliya uh, and you know his way of dealing with it is to subdue the serpent by dancing with it so two very different approaches to dealing with the fractaling nature of infinity, perhaps. So this is an image from 1994 by Yayo Kosama called Yellow Trees. And these look like snakes, but I think that is part of the point because tree roots and serpent bodies are sort of, you know, loaded with the same kind of information. And for Kusama, this, like a motif like this ends up becoming a, something that like gets extended in every direction, whether it's in a mirror room or an outfit that you can wear that matches the furniture. <laughs> I think they actually had this, the, uh, this was like printed out on the outside of the Whitney too uh, at this time. So uh, Yayo Kusama just had a big retrospective in Seattle and if you um, maybe ho hopefully got to see it, she's this, she moved to the United States in, in the 1950s and actually moved to Seattle first and had an exhibition at the Zoe Dusan Gallery which was an influential Seattle gallery. And then George O'Keefe was like, yeah, you need to move to New York. So she did. And um, when she gets to New York, she's, she's got this first series of paintings um, that she got really became known for, which were these net paintings, where she covered the entire canvas with this web-like network. Um, and this is something that, you know, it, it kind of marries minimalism with expressive, you know, with uh, abstract expressionism. And she got written about in Art in America or whatever, because she was friends with the right people. But uh, for comparison, <laughs> I mean, she really, she, yeah, right, that's what was going on. But, um, uh, but for comparison, you know, this is a, a painting by Australian Aboriginal artist Gloria Patari called Bush Medicine, and another one here called Mountain Devil Lizard Dreaming. And these are contemporary paintings, but they're like manifestations of uh, cultural and spiritual practice that's ancient. Dream time is the Australian Aboriginal sacred understanding of the world, the time when the ancestors were born out of eternity. So, and this is Kusama again. So Kusama describes these net paintings as without beginning, end, or center. The entire canvas would be occupied by a monochromatic net. This endless repetition caused a kind of dizzy, empty, hypnotic feeling. So, but, for a painting, however, to truly have no beginning, end, or center, it has to occupy the space outside the painting, which is what she started experimenting with in New York, with sculpture, installation, and eventually performance and film. Here's, I think this is a detail of this. So this is a, a still from the 1967 film, Kusama's Self-Obliteration, made in collaboration with the experimental filmmaker Judd Yalkut, 
which features Kusama painting dots on herself in the water on a horse. So does this remind you of anything? <laughs> Even her hand is positioned like a hand. And finally, on nude bodies packed into a room together in one of her signature happenings, like the one she staged in the fountain of the Sculpture Garden of the Whitney in 1969, grand orgy to awaken the dead. So part of the inspiration for Kusama's work comes from hallucinations that she's experienced since childhood. Here's how she describes those hallucinations in an interview produced by the Tate in 2012. When I was drawing, the pattern would expand outside the canvas to fill the floor and the wall. So when I looked far away, I would see a hallucination. And I would get surrounded by that vision. That's how I became an environmental artist. With the infinity rooms, the viewer is able to step into this visionary realm. The hallucination becomes the entire environment. The whole universe becomes the artist's mind, or vice versa. For Kusama, there's also a therapeutic angle to this work. In 1977, when she returned to Japan after two decades in the US, she voluntarily had herself committed to a mental hospital in Tokyo, where she's lived ever since, checking out every morning to work in the studio and checking in every night, mm -hmm. which I think is a great really? idea. It's such, a good, <laughs> it's such a good life hack. <laughs> cook for you. <laughs> so the concept of artists experiencing hallucinations or receiving visions has a long history wrapped up in questions regarding the nature of revelation. What is divinely inspired? What is true revelation? And, you know, what's the line between artist and madman or a woman? Although technically not a visual artist herself, the 12th century Benedictine abbess Hildegard of Bingen experienced visions from a young age and was basically handed over by her parents to the church. They were like, here, you deal with this. I think she's, there's some information in here I think you want to know about. And they were, they were like, yeah, they were into her. That's what the best part of this story is that she dictated her visions to scribes who like made paintings based on them. Uh, people composed music based on her visions. She oversaw the creation of miniature paintings. Um, so all of these you know, people took her seriously and there was like sort of an army of people going, yeah, yeah, this is, this is good. This is the good stuff. So Hildegard belongs to a tradition of visionaries um, that are sort of on the weird fringes of European Christian history. Uh, includes individuals like Jakob Boma and Emanuel Swedenborg. Uh, individuals whose otherworldly visions were ultimately codified within a Christian framework, although they stretched it greatly around the edges. And perhaps the greatest visionary artist within this tradition is the English poet, painter, and engraver William Blake, who was born in 1757 and lived almost his entire life in London. Blake believed that the streets of London were themselves enchanted, that hidden inside this dimension are unseen realms. Blake's parents were dissenters, a group of Protestants that broke off from the Church of England. Blake's own dissent took a radical form. He disliked all forms of authoritarianism and cultivated a sense of his own spiritual eccentricity from a precocious age. His relationship to traditional Christianity can be summed up from these lines from his poem, The Everlasting Gospel. The vision of Christ that thou dost see is my vision's greatest enemy. Both read the Bible day and night, but thou readst black, where I read white. At the age of four, he claims to have seen God for the first time, looking out the window of his bedroom, causing him to scream. At the age of seven or eight, he saw a tree filled with angels, bright angelic wings bespangling every bough like stars. He told his parents about the vision, and his father threatened to whip him for lying, and his mother interceded on his behalf. She was his champion. She would hang his drawings on her bedroom wall. <laughs> She's like one of the only people who liked his art when he was alive. He had like a handful of patrons, but he was kind of, he, he wasn't as popular as he thought he should have been. So Blake had three brothers. The youngest one, Robert, was his favorite, and Blake taught him how to draw. Sadly, Robert died of tuberculosis at the age 24. Blake watched his brother die. 
and at the moment of death said he saw his brother's released spirit ascending heavenward through the matter-of-fact ceiling, clapping its hands for joy. Blake believed that his brother continued to communicate with him from beyond the grave, and also communicated directly and openly with other spirits who informed the spiritual qualities of his work, which took the form of illustration for others, such as this illustration for a poem by Robert Blair, the soul hovering over the body, reluctantly parting with life, which seems to be related to his experience of having watched his brother die. But also, his own self-published books for which he composed the poetry, did the illustrations, etched and printed the plates, and colored by hand. Blake's first book is called America, a Prophecy, published in 1790. It exists in 17 copies, four of which are hand colored. So this is one of many books of prophecy that he wrote where historical movements were personified by larger than life archetypal beings from Blake's imagination. The king is a character, as is the angel of Boston. In this book, Blake has the daughters of Albion, which are his characters that sort of come through all his poems, look to the west, to America, because he believed there was a promise in America that would one day end all forms of discrimination. It was to be in America that races would live in harmony and women would be able to claim their own sexuality. Blake's cosmology was thoroughly embedded with the erotic, and he thought politics was thoroughly saturated with sexuality and identified sexual repression as the root cause of violence, uh, prefiguring Wilhelm Reich, who wrote the same thing about the Nazis after World War II. <clears throat> So on the right here is a page from his Visions of the Daughter of Albion, 1793, in which the character Oathawan <laughs> represents both America and the representation of womanhood. And she is held captive and raped by a character named Bromion, who represents a philosophical system created by John Locke. <laughs> So this is one of my favorite paintings of all time, and it was first created as a monotype in 1795 and reworked in 1805. So this is Blake's rendition of Newton, who to him represented all of the folly and limitation of a dualistic, rationalist worldview. Uh, and here's you know, a poem from his, that, that, where he like, talks about Newton. Now a fourfold vision I see, and a fourfold vision is given to me, Tis fourfold in my supreme delight, and threefold in soft Beulah's night, and twofold always may God us keep from single vision and Newton's sleep. So Newton's sleep is characterized by like a limitation of vision, almost like sort of cutting ourselves off from all the, po all the other possible colors in the spectrum that we could be seeing, all the other frequencies. I've also been reading a lot lately about the influence of the alphabet and written language on like sort of the, the way it makes us overuse the left brain and just sort of dismiss the capabilities, the sort of holistic function of the right brain, which is an interesting thesis that dovetails with all these things. In Blake's cosmology, the fall is caused by sexual jealousy, which leads to shame and alienation. On the left uh, is the illustration of Adam and Eve, you can see like, Eve is, you know, wrapped up in the whole snake situation and <laughs> eating fruit that didn't come in plastic from Trader Joe's. And, uh, and Adam is, you know, alienated from this scene. He's like searching for answers, but he's also completely fundamentally dis, you know, he's, he's not oriented toward where she is even at all. He's looking into like the, out into the abstraction for whatever he's gonna get on about. Um, and on the right, these are from his like illustrations of Paradise Lost. Here are the, here are the lovers sort of entwined and uh, sort of the role of Satan in this is as a covering cherub that like makes, sort of creates and causes shame. So if there's like sort of this tension um, between uniting the male and female halves and the shame that keeps them separated. So this is Jerusalem. Blake's last, longest epic poem. It tells the story of the fall of Albion, Blake's embodiment of man, Britain, or the Western world as a whole. It's the most dense psychological drama. And 
the great city of Golgonzola that he talks about in Jerusalem is, is equivalent to his spiritual London. So here's, I'm quoting Blake here. He's sort of talking visionarily. He's like laying this place out spatially in these dimensions. He's creating this sort of virtual reality for us to walk through in the poem. In the North Gate, in the west of the north, toward Beulah, there is a golden hall of cathedron that contains the Eneth Harbin's looms, the womb, where the physical body of man is woven. That's an interesting image. There's the gate of Luban, the vagina, in the middle of the city. All of these is surrounded by a moat of fire. Golgonzola is walled against Satan and his wars. Around the city, there's a land of Alamanda, this is the nervous system of the vegetated man. <laughs> in the forests of Entuthon Bentheon with the Lake of Udon Anon, fourfold internal structure of the city reflects the fourfold structure of the sons of Los. Blake explains as follows. <coughs> I don't have the sons of Los in here. Well, we'll have to imagine them. So this sort of like four, he's got this, yeah, this whole cosmological drama, but, um, Fourfold the sons of Los in their divisions, and fourfold the great city of Golgonzola, Golgonzo, Golgonoza, it's such a, you know, fourfold toward the north and toward the south, fourfold, and fourfold toward the east and west, each within other, toward the four points that toward Eden and toward the world of generation and toward Beulah and that toward Oro. Oro is the space of the terrible starry wheels of Albion's sons but that toward Eden is walled off till time of renovation. Yet, it is perfect in its building, ornaments, and perfection. So he's sort of talking about this, like ima imagining this very visionary space, and it seems completely arcane, but it also maps onto sort of, uh, you know, this, for instance, the starry wheels of the visions of Ezekiel in the Old Testament, which Blake also illustrated. Um, and at the end of Jerusalem, all things become a great living divine body. So on the left, we have these are two late, late paintings, Christ's Blessing from 1810 and The Last Judgment from 1808. Um, so these, uh, the, I, I've always thought the one on the right was just like the trippiest thing. It's sort of, you know, there's this being sort of coming into and passing out of, of creation. Uh, you know, and it's like, this is, but it also, the form seems so strained. It's kind of like a body, kind of like a demon. And uh, I was at a conference where an art historian sort of mapped these. Her name's Martha, Martha Gyllenhaal. She just put them right on top of each other, and it blew my mind. <laughs> because the body and the cosmic situation are on top of each other. So Blake came to, claimed throughout his life to have seen visions. So the things he was writing down were like presented to him. He wasn't composing them in any way. He claimed they were a common aspect throughout his life and his understanding of the events was, as he explained, similar to the experiences of biblical prophets. In the commentary to A Vision of the Last Judgment, Blake claimed that the image, that the image here on the, on the right of the Last Judgment originated in a particular vision he experienced that allowed him to see the host of heaven praising God. So. And here's an illustration of Jacob's ladder. So he's like often illustrating these biblical and, and biblical uh, things, uh, stories. Uh, so the story of Jacob's ladder is also like sort of like a shamanic vision. He's got his, he's got a pillow of stone, he sees a ladder opening up into heaven, and all throughout Blake you have this thing happening where there's like pairs of male, male and female angels, and this is based on sort of like Swedenborg's theology, and it's kind of related to like Jung's idea of like animus and anima, these sort of like male and female halves that need to be sort of integrated into like a healthy person. But a lot of the features from this painting, I, I noticed, I kept thinking about this painting over and over again um, earlier this year when I went to New York to see Helma of Klint's exhibition at the Guggenheim. Uh, so this is an installation of this. And you know, these, have been, these paintings have been shown around Europe, but this was the first time for all of them to be presented in the US. And I saw them in London in like 2015, and I almost didn't go to the Guggenheim, and I'm so glad I did because it, they were presented in a spiral, which was the way she always envisioned them being. So this was like really the presentation of this work, I think. 
So the artistic production of Hilma of Klint includes over a thousand oil paintings, hundreds of works on paper, and some 125 notebooks, none of which were exhibited during her own lifetime. She also stipulated they were not to be shown until at least 20 years after her death. Why? She didn't think people would understand them, which reminds me of William Blake, who said of his work, I labor upward into futurity. So here we are in the future, and we're getting the painting. We are the future, so we get to see them. So there's a sort of time travel implicit in this work. And her, her, uh, her whole projection of her trajectory as an artist is really interesting because the earliest works are these very detailed portraits and botanical drawings. And a slide can't really do justice to how meticulous these are. Um, and I think this is important because it contextualizes her as an observational artist. Even when what she's drawing is very spiritual and abstract in nature, she's reproducing the things that she's seeing with a very skilled hand. So beginning around 1896, the artist began to isolate herself from the male-dominated art scene in Stockholm, but she was not entirely antisocial. Every Friday, she met with a group of four other women, including the artist Anna Castle, who she knew from art school. These women called themselves DFEM, or The Five. They engaged in seances during which they encountered beings who identified themselves as Gregor, Clemens, Amelial, and Ananda, who, could, who wanted to communicate with humanity through pictures. During these meetings, of which the group kept meticulous minutes, they would do automatic drawings in pencil and pastel, most of which would simply be signed DF for DFEM. And here are some of these in color. So these, we don't know which person's hand made them, and it doesn't matter because the spirits made them. So during this time, Hilma F. Clint learned to trust the spirits and her own abilities as a medium. In 1905, when she was 44 years old, Amaliel, one of the spirits, commissioned her to produce a series of paintings called The Paintings for the Temple. And they sort of start out like looking a lot like these automatic drawings, very sort of unconscious material. We see snakes, we see spirals. Um, and so the context for this medium, mediumistic activity is really important to her work because we don't know, you know, she, she didn't show the work at all during her life. She did go to art school. She did know about contemporary art, but she wasn't interested in like the capitalist aspect of art exhibitions or anything like that. But she was interested in spiritualism, which is a popular movement in the 19th century characterized by belief and interest in the existence of unseen worlds especially the ability to communicate with souls in the afterlife. Now today, we're often encouraged to draw a hard line between the physical sciences and what we might term exploration of the spirit world. Um, but around the turn of the last century, new discoveries in science were actually absolutely fueling this interest in spiritualism. Um, for instance, this is a photograph uh, by Etienne Leopold Trouvelot, made by a spark. And at this point, photography was still a new medium, and people were pushing the boundaries of what they could capture with photography. So this is an image that's sort of like, this is a thing that happens so fast that you could never see it with the naked eye, but photography is sort of a tool that makes possible seeing the unseen. So another example would be of this sort of sensory augmentation of photography would be x-rays, which were discovered by Wilhelm Röntgen in 1895, which revealed a hidden world inside of us, but outside of view. Likewise, the successful transmission of electromagnetic waves by Heinrich Hertz in 1896 demonstrated the possibility for invisible information to travel through the atmosphere. Today, we take for granted that satellites can beam information to and from space almost instantaneously, and that the electrical activity of our brains can be mapped. But during this time, when so much of the science was new and really just provided a glimpse under the uncharted territory of the future, many artists stood at that frontier of discovery and not so much speculated as attempted in various ways to open themselves to new ways of observing reality. These were these new realities that were just being discovered. So On the Origin of Species, published in 1859, had a huge influence on spiritualism, as did certain texts like the Bhagavad Gita, which were becoming available in the West at the same time. 
Um, so not only was evolution emerging as a science in the late 19th century, this is also when we're kind of starting to perceive in the Western world that Christianity and Judaism didn't exactly appear of thin air, but actually came to their present states through complex histories, and that other religions have made sense of the world differently. And the Theosophical Society was sort of an, in, like a, like they were trying to integrate all of this into like one true religion. Um, and Helmuth Klint was a member of the Theosophical Society from the founding of its first chapter in Sweden. So the, the goal of theosophy was to elevate spiritualism to an objective status. This meant the attempt to find or create a religion that would unite Christianity, Judaism, Buddhism, Hinduism, and then also the science of evolutionary theory, a new religion. And of course, you know, we know about theosophy from artists like Kandinsky, who were influenced by the theosophists. And you know, Kandinsky is often cited as one of the first European artists to create completely non-objective paintings. And we know his own painting was very influenced by synesthesia, specifically the experience of hearing sounds associated with the perception of certain colors. So for Kandinsky, working on visual art was the process of resolving his own inner sounds, selecting notes that reinforced each other in pleasing harmonies that he called spiritual chords, relying on intuition. So in Hilma F. Clint's work, uh, you know, we're, this is sort of a context for it. Uh, she's definitely working within the context of theosophy, but also creating completely abstract work before the work that was being known for this. So there's a few like, uh, like motifs that sort of originate in the work. Obviously here we have like a spiral that looks like, you know, like a snail or something. We also have these letters that start coming, U and W. And for Helma of Clint, like U means the spiritual and W stands for the material. Uh, so, and you know, the, the, the snail, the spiral signifies evolution. It's like a, a cycle in which transformation occurs, but also inwardness as a labyrinth pointing inward which is why she dreamed of her paintings and for the temple being housed in a spiral building. And it sounds really weird, but there was also artists completely unrelated to Home of Clint doing similar things, like Georgiana Houghton, who's a little known British artist who started attending seances and producing spirit drawings with the guidance of spirits in 1859, long before Home of Clint. Uh, her work was just the subject of a retrospective in the UK. Like F. Clint, she was uh, overlooked for a long time due to her association with spiritualism. When Helma F. Clint died, her nephew actually tried to give all of her paintings to the museum, and they were like, woman artist, spiritualism, no thanks. <laughs> and now it's the highest, growth, uh, highest attendance of any show in the history of the Guggenheim. Mm -hmm. so. um, another sort of outsider who had nothing to do with anyone else that was making crazy stuff at this time is one of my favorite painters, Augustin Lesage, who started out as a coal miner. He was born in 1876 into a family of coal miners in the small city of Ochelle in northern France. And when he was about 35 years old, one evening down in the mines, he started to hear a voice from the darkness and it started speaking to him. It said, do not be afraid. One day you will be a painter. <laughs> <laughs> So he, you know, he, he, he's never experienced a hallucination before, so he just, you know, he did what most of us would do. He repressed the memory and kept it a secret from his wife and didn't talk about it. But the inner voices were persistent. Determined to cipher their, decipher their cryptic commands, he found a way into a spiritualist circle, started attending seances and secret parties where he learned the art of automatic writing, training himself to become a conduit for the messages of spirits who apparently wished so desperately to communicate through him. The spirits told him, the voices you heard down in the mines were real, they speak the truth, you will be a painter. Don't be afraid, don't try to understand it, just heed our advice, even though you will find it ridiculous at first. We are the ones who are tracing through your hand. The voices then instructed Lesage on where to order art supplies and which colors and brushes to buy. When the canvas arrived, it was three meters square, and Lesage tried to cut it down, and the voice stopped him. No, no, no. That's how big the painting is. So every night after Lesage came home from the mines, he would spend the evening painting what the spirits told him to paint. Describing this process, he wrote, before I started to paint, I never have any idea what I wanted to portray. 
I never have an overview of the entire work at any point during the execution. My guides tell me, don't try to understand what you're doing, and I surrender to their impulse. It's like working without working. So here's some examples of these. And I actually found out about this artist because someone sent me this image based on one of those images I showed you early on. Like, this looks like what you do. And I was like, this is better than what I do, but also, <laughs> what? And then I it couldn't find anything on English, so I actually translated some stuff and put it, we wrote the first English article on the internet about this guy like 10 years ago, and it still has a lot of hits. <laughs> but this is wild, it's like, it looks like a face. Who is he talking to? What is, who is, the, who, who the hell is this, you know? So something I didn't mention earlier, which I think is really interesting about both Augustine Lesage and Helma of Clint, that they had in common with William Blake is dead siblings. Helma of Clint lost a sister, and Augustine Lesage lost a sister as well. So these, you know, par part of your, like, your blood, your family, like part of your generation is in the spirit world. And um, if that has something to, you know, that, that certainly had something to do with um, Lesage. Uh, he one of his sister was one of the spirits he was talking to. So, so he says, you know, it's like working without working. Well, Helma of Clint's relationship to the paintings for the temple was very similar. She gives a really similar quote. The pictures were painted directly through me without any preliminary drawings and with great force. I had no ideas what the paintings were supposed to depict. Nevertheless, I worked swiftly and surely without changing a single brush stroke. Now, eventually, this relationship led to direct inspiration from the spirits. <clears throat> so, the, sorry, the relationship to the direct inspiration began to shift. In later life, like, they sort of had this burst of, like, spiritual activity, and then they started to have this period where they were like, okay, I have a style, and they tried to work in that style. And F. Clint's work definitely goes through this phase where it's, she's synthesizing the ideas that have been given to her by the spirits. So this is from 1908. It's from a series on the theme of evolution. And here we get a lot more narrative than the rest of her work. Uh, you know, looking at this, I think, number one, there's an intentional choice to render crudely. Remember, she's a very great observational painter. There's no reason for her to paint so simply, except that that's what she wants to be doing. Um, you know, there's a man on the left that's kind of looking into this microcosm almost of what's going on or like this maybe this maybe an abstraction there's an object that he's looking at and on the right the woman is looped in with the spiral and thus the whole of nature and you know of course the man and woman probably aren't literal but they're sort of these spiritual stand-ins and this reminds me a lot of Blake Newton being involved in his own the creation of his own mind uh, and also this image we looked at of Adam and Eve, you know, the axis mundi in the center, be, being the tree of knowledge, and the sort of relationship, these gendered relationships to reality. It's complicated to talk about this stuff without slipping into like a, a gendered essentialism, but I think that uh, these are sort of images that come about out of the acknowledgement of a misogynistic mindset that is inside of rationality that needs to be dealt with. And these, I think these two images, just like side by side, like they're talking to each other. So here we have a much more sort of optimistic image from Helma of Clint. Similar elements, but the male and female halves are united into this sort of you know, chakra system. The whole thing lights up now because they're spiritually uh, integrated. And the axis mundi that would kind of come to dominate the late 19, the late uh, 1919s, 19 teens, you know, up to 1920, becomes a central theme. There's like a cross in a lot of these paintings, uh, including this one. So I'm just going to go through really quickly a series, now that you know some of the things about Hilma of Clint's work. Uh, yellow and blue are the colors she sort of uses to represent materiality and spirituality. There's a U and a W. Uh, she's thinking about um, the spirals, uh, the birds. So this is a series called The Swan, and it kind of goes through this like transformation that's almost like filmic, um, like it's unfolding like a cartoon or an anim animation. 
And if you know kind of a little bit about how to read the work, then you can kind of read this as like a spiritual drama unfolding. So I'm just gonna be quiet when I go through these. So a really similar progression happens in Carl Jung's Red Book, which coincidentally is being produced at roughly exactly the precise moment when Augustin Lesage and Hilma of Klimt were also performing their spirit-guided painting. And Kandinsky was formalizing his ideas on spiritual art. Jung was devoting himself to the creation of a handmade book he called Liber Novus, the new book, which is more commonly referred to as the Red Book. The project began as a personal diary chronicling a period of deep, almost psychotic depression, triggered in part by Jung's falling out with Freud in 1913. Their friendship had unraveled because Jung increasingly began to question Freud's preoccupation with the unconsciousness as a, rep a reservoir of repressed desires. And Jung came to understand Freud's view of the unconscious to be crudely limited and dualistic rather than tethering his idea of the unconscious to the specific drives or desires of an individual, Jung was beginning to think the unconscious mind in layers, with certain processes originating in a species-wide, possibly evolutionarily derived collective unconscious. So from the time Jung stopped working on it in 1930 until its first publication in 2009, the Red Book had been seen by fewer than a dozen people. His heirs kept it private for nearly five decades after his death due to its strange revealing content. For Jung, the unconscious is no hypothetical intellectual construct. It's a force he directly felt and observed during the period documented by the Red Book. Of this period, he later wrote, the years when I, produced, when I pursued the inner images were the most important time of my life. Everything else is to be derived from this. It began at that time, and the later details from the unconscious had and flooded me like an enigmatic stream and threatened to break me. That was the stuff and material for more than only one life. Everything later was merely the outer classification scientific elaboration and the integration into life. But the numinous beginning which contained everything was then. It was during this period that I gained the crucial insight and there are things in the psyche which I do not produce, which produce themselves and have their own life. During the turbulent romantic 1960s, a generation of artists openly investigated their primal subconscious spiritual impulses. Carolee Schneemann, who passed away recently, began her career as an expressionistic painter. I like her paintings better than de Kooning or Pollock, but as soon as she began to explore sexuality, the altered states of consciousness in her work, there were critics who just didn't get it. This is from Meet Joy, 1964, where the painting sort of extends onto the body as a performance and people fill the space. 
And this is a performance called Up To and Including Her Limits from 1973, where she is sort of starving herself and involved in this like trance state in order to produce the work. And she's underrated in like 20th century art history. Everybody knows who she is, but I think it's like the, I think that we find sexuality embarrassing, but we find spirituality even more embarrassing. Um, so, the, around the exact same time as Meet Joy, in 1964, an artwork that no one ever saw was being made. Uh, this is James Hampton, the throne of the third heaven of the nation's millennium general assembly. And this was made by, uh, this guy was a reclusive worker at the General Services Administration in Washington, D.C., and he died of stomach cancer. And his rented garage lay unopened until the landlord decided to rent it out and opened it to find a trove of glittering silvery objects. Reluctant to dispose of the strange collection, the landlord contacted museums, local net newspapers, and even the New York Times. Eventually, the Na National Collection of Fine Arts, now the Smithsonian American Art Museum, agreed to pay the past due rental fees for the garage and acquired in 1970 the incredibly, the inc indescribable hoard later known to the world as the throne of the third heaven, nation's millennium general assembly, or simply the Hampton throne. The silvery gleam was caused by the reflections from aluminum foil covering almost every surface. It had never been seen. I love this. I think that the, the need to produce work that no one will ever see makes the work so, like I love the posthumous artwork. So I'm gonna talk through a few slides um, at, here at the very end of just contemporary artists working with different facets of this sort of weird story that I just sort of like blurted out um, through strange pictures. Um, and the first is an, an exhibition that just came down. It was at Seattle Art Museum by Jeffrey Gibson. And uh, these, like, you know, Jeffrey Gibson makes these works that kind of incorporate beads and powwow jingles and things. He's like Choctaw and Cherokee. And you know, a lot of the work is like, okay, you're using these materials to make this art, but then these two figures in the exhibition uh, were very strange. And I saw him talk about the work and he talked about how they came to him from dreams. And so this was one of them, the face of the ceramic figure. And he talked about how embarrassing it was where you had to get over the embarrassment of using dream images, partly because of the expectation on an indigenous artist to, um, you know, not, the, there's like a romanticization of indigenous spirituality coupled with like not actually wanting that. And, uh, you know, he was talking about when, you know, Jackson Pollock was doing his thing, his own grandfather was becoming a Baptist minister and like disowning sort of traditional religions. So to come back intuitively into an art making practice where these sort of strange beings are just revealing themselves um, is something that he was like a weird personal thing. And I think they stood out so much in this work, in this like exhibition full of work that's obviously produced um, because it's, you know, he makes a lot of these punching bags and a lot of museums buy the punching bags, but these works seem really special in a different way. Uh, this is one of my favorite artists. This is Morishin Aliari, who is lives in New York City and sort of investigates pre-Islamic goddess cultures and also like artifacts destroyed by ISIS and things like this. Um, but she did a thing for the Whitney, like an online project called The Laughing Snake. And this is this like sort of feminine serpentine spirit that like sort of goes on forever and like terrorizes, but the way to sort of like beat it is by like showing it its own reflection and then it just starts laughing but then it like re <laughs> doubles off and goes somewhere else so this is an interactive website for interacting with the spirit and i like this because it sort of takes an idea you know he's looked at the helm f clint and the carl jung you see these ideas of spirituality trying to be rendered in pictures and digital space sort of lets us create something that um, exists inside of a digital space, like the weird poetic descriptions that Blake was doing. What if Blake had, had, like, had access to like VR or something? What would that be? <laughs> <laughs> uh, this is Moore Mother, um, who is also a visual, she's a musician, but also a visual artist. And um, this was from an exhibition at the Kitchen last year. 
And she's involved in a project also, in addition to her music, called Black Quantum Futurism that is sort of a theoretical uh, complex for investigating like the nature of time and the possibilities of like memory and the future and also like reconfiguring the present by like learning about the past and reconfiguring the future. So I think that there is absolutely a visionary quality to this. It's, it's like about creating the world that you want to live in and um, having sort of an active participation with that visionary thing, but also being open to let the future write through you, which is a visionary thing. Um, yeah, and I put some friends in here too because of where we are also. I feel like, um, you know, Birch and Brenna measure this, the, the idea of letting the forms do be what they want to be and sort of come into being uh, is something that is like very present and prevalent in their work. And also the way the form takes on the quality of the sort of reflective, refractive digital space. And I think that, um, you know, by putting on some of the works they've been doing for VR have an absolutely visionary quality that makes me excited where this sort of theory of what human beings have been trying to render the spirit world can do in a digital context. And my sort of last slide is of the space that we're in and the ways that this space works, both sort of as a, like time and people sort of threading through it and passing through it, but also it's sort of digital manifestations. Um, we could say a lot about this, but I've been to a lot of the nativities through the years. I've participated in a nativity. One year I sang in front of a giant resonating body of water that was like right here, and then the next year that body of water was virtual and I got baptized in it by Matt who had big tits for some reason. <laughs> it was fantastic. And 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 I and I and I think that was really spiritual. <laughs> I, I, I was baptized, and so this is my faith now, I think, is this, is this place. Um, uh, it, it was on one of those like back stretcher things where you hang upside down. Um, I, I absolutely love this space, and I love Matt's practice, and I wanted to put Matt in here as the very last person in this slide lecture because, because I feel like the, the commitment to thinking about these weird, awkward, strange, embarrassing manifestations of... Uh, what we have suppressed, like, look, we've suppressed these things for a reason. They don't fit into our, the idea of art as a commodity or the idea of value as a commodity that we place on everything. So art that gets made for its own sake, something weird that you make in a garage and never show anyone, or paintings that you labor upward to futurity or don't let them be seen until 30 years after you die. I mean, those are my people, but you're doing it now. <laughs> and we're looking at what you're making, and it might not make sense right now, you know? And I think it makes sense as it collaborates with and moves through time. And so, yeah, I'd like to uh, end on that note. If anyone has any questions, I'm sorry if I went way too long. I had way too many slides in there, I think. But, mm -hmm. eh, yes. All right. <laughs> I haven't looked too much into Shaker stuff at all, but that's really, there's also all this weird, um, like, uh, Pennsylvania Dutch witchcraft tradition that's like I've sort of discovered. So um, I left it out of this talk because there's so many different things I wanted to show. I just wanted to show a lot of like, home of Clint William Blake, but, um, but like the uh, spiritualism as a movement and it's sort of as a trend started in like western new york which is like the burned over country which i think is where shakerism started and there's sort of like all these you know i think christian scientists there's all these sort of like cults and sects and mormonism like the plates were found you know all that stuff found in there and they called it burned over because like every few years there would like a cult would come along and everybody would convert to it. It was burned over because there was nobody left to convert to a new cult because everybody was in a different cult. But yeah, like psychedelic America, American religions, like that's a, um, that is, I feel like this 
a talk with this title could have like an infinite number of things in it. You could take it in a lot of directions. But I'm, it's interesting that you bring up the fact that like it's like a women's art because that's, that's an interesting thing to look about for the future. I will look at, I will Google that for me and you can Google that for you. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm super, yeah, I'm super interested in, like, I will look at that on the way home. I have a wild week. Cool. Yeah. Uh, this is kind of a cynical perspective, but it seems like at a point art transitioned from artists being justified by making religious artwork for a church, mm -hmm. making Christian artwork or Islamic artwork in the name of God or the church, and then at a point, artists probably felt like they needed to be justified in creating work. Uh, you know, maybe with the, the rise of conceptual artwork or something like that. So do you think that people reach for spirituality and channeling to, you know, like yeah. close off, just like, just go out and get some art supplies <laughs> if you want to paint. You know? <laughs> but there's like this whole... Uh, but he needed the Mythos. voice to tell him to do it. He needed yeah. permission, but you think he was being dominated by the beyond. <laughs> well, on the one hand, maybe he was. And on the other hand, I think maybe, so too. maybe there's like... <laughs> that's the question. The yeah. cynical perspective is like, maybe this person is like self-mythologizing or something. Yeah. Maybe artists, maybe artists do that. But then it's kind of like a sneak eating its tail. So I've been to where he's from and it's not. It's like, it's like, like imagine growing up in like a haystack in like, you know, Eastern Washington or something. It's just like, it's like coal mining country. There's nothing out there. There would have been, he would have had no access to like art exhibits or even probably like books about art. Like his, his the, the level of access, that's something I always think about is like, I think a lot about the history of writing and representation and how like what we, you know, how you can't really wrap your head around what it was like to be like pre-literate and seeing, you know, seeing printed pictures for the first time, like, holy crap, I can take this home, you know? Um, but like, yeah, I think the trajectory for art, I mean, it kind of develops and happens really in different times and places, but different people have different relationships to art and they often like have kind of a, almost like a complementary or opposite relationship to language, you know? Hebrews, very interested in the written language, not interested at all in art, visual art to the extent of like imposing a, um, a taboo about representing a form, you know, that kind of comes through in like Judaism and uh, Islam and even some Christianity. Um, that sort of like the idea that the written word could be taken very seriously, but uh, the image is like something that could be easily profaned or you could use it to manipulate people. I think there's something about the sensuality of images that makes it a form that's like easy to manipulate people, you know? And so like that, it's kind of a magic. There's magic to making images. Like the earliest images in my slideshow are like from a book called Myth and Magic and Painted, or Trance and Magic in Painted Caves or something. It's like, what kind of magic, you know? And it's just about like the hunt and animals, but it's about transforming reality through experiencing, you know, representation and orienting yourself around the stories that go with that representation. And it changes, like, do like Afrofuturism, it changes the future. You, you put some conscious attention into something and then you materialize it, right? Um, that's kind of the function and role that art had. And I think that's why art is such an important tool for someone that wants to make, wants to use religion as a way to sort of justify or, uh, you know, buttress a regime is you have propaganda. You know, nowadays we have like weird companies pouring all this money into memes for the internet. <laughs> so they will like convert people into like YouTube white nationalism or something. You know, this is like, it's like, wow. But also like, it makes sense like there, it's, it's that it's happening through video and not necessarily text because video is like engages us in this other way, like images go where words can't, you know, which is why I show some of those images silently, because what are you gonna say about that? At a certain point, it's like, this is just a picture of a thing, you know? Um, but it pulls us, it pulls on our souls. <laughs> and so I think being aware of the power of images and the history of how we've, how political the, who gets to make images, the fact that abstract expressionism was this thing that was being propped up while you know, uh, 
we were actively um, legally marginalizing very violently, you know, people like indigenous people and uh, people whose unbroken traditions were being sort of almost appropriated or channeled in different ways. Um, that, you know, that one thing gets propped up by the CIA, <laughs> you know, and then and um, other people are being marginalized because it's like that, that art is magical and a commodity. And so it's a magical commodity and like, magical commodities kind of rule the world at this point, right? <laughs> so you gotta break the spell of what, the, you gotta make magical commodities that are, that, that, on, that break the spell. How do you, you know, ooh, what does that look like? I don't know. You're doing it, I mean, this place, does, I feel like you're doing that. It looks like a bowl of huh? That sounds like a great way to break the spell of me talking any longer. <laughs> Um, I wondered if you had any thoughts on how uh, the visual, like you had those ones, you know, the different motifs, kind of universal motifs, and the idea of like that they come from within, and visual cortex, and um, just any thought on the, how those motifs relate literally to the body and its energy as an expression of embodied, of embodied energy that maybe is also related to movement and dance and like what we call serpent energy or kundalini. Totally, right? yeah, absolutely. I mean, at a certain point, what I could, like the images say more than I can even say about that, but right, but there is a, there's, there's absolutely a relationship between this image and the body and the body being sort of like integrated and in alignment and, you know, sort of met like meditating on a form, sigil magic and stuff like that. Um, like, yeah, uh, what I could, I mean, what people could say about that fills volumes. What I could say about that is point to a picture because I look at pictures. <laughs> but yeah, totally. I mean, I think also the body, the relationship, the, um, the, the art historian who realized that these two images by William Blake can fit on top of each other and that these two seemingly unrelated paintings were actually like the last judgment is like the human condition inside, you know, mm -hmm. Christ, the body of Christ is this space where this sort of cosmic unfolding is happening. Like these two things are not separate. If he did not intend this, and I think it's, it's so, this is so trippy, but like the, like next to the central axis form, you can almost see like the hand coming out. Like it's not even clear whether he in, tended this, but it works this way, you know? Mm. Um, and I think he's talking about the body on different scales. You know, the body is like, like the body is like what's happening right now, but it's also like all of the time, energy, and history, and everything, every single donut you've ever eaten, <laughs> being, being shit out across the world, across space time, in this like giant, you know? Uh, uh, and all of that, material go you know it's like that um like 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 getting outside of linear time when thinking about a body like all of a sudden like the form of the body like maybe takes more of a ex explosion it becomes we all but we are all vishvarupa and it's too much so it doesn't we tone it down but yeah i don't know yes i think about that stuff <laughs> i don't know if that's a weird answer but no i figure i just yeah yeah I hear more thoughts yeah cool any yeah anybody else have a thought on that yeah um, I was just curious, it seemed to be like um, massage and um, like it seemed like there was a distinction in your talk between some artists who had the, the images sort of like inflicted on them versus artists like who are saying there's spiritualism or who don't yeah. research people who like reached out and invited in these images. And I was wondering like you know, suffering from hallucinations or auditory hallucinations versus like getting together with your girlfriend yeah. and trying to talk to spirits. Like, the, <laughs> yeah. like, do you think that there, I mean, it seems like a lot of times the people who invited it, them said, this is now just happening. To yeah. You. But like, do you think that there's a distinction between the images that come from people who were sort of inflicted with them versus the people who 
That's a really interesting question. I mean, I, I use the quotes of Vilma Clint and Augustine Lesage side by side because they both talked about the images coming through them in really similar terms. They also have in common that she's got a dead sister. And that's like, I think spiritualism for her was like a way to talk to uh, William Blake, Augustine Lesage, and Vilma Clint all have in common like a sibling on the other side. And so like the um, inviting in in a certain way is like maybe you're already kind of a little cracked open from having that like wound of like, you know, just like like having like loving across the grave. I don't know if you who has like lo like extreme love across the grave, but it's a it, it's an opening, you know. It, it, it opens all this. There's contact, there's connection. It's like a you know there's a reciprocity to some something on the other side that like is a starting point, you know. But yeah, that is a good point. Like in terms of like. The, Consent, <laughs> because like, because like Lesage was like non-consensually domed by the infinite. <laughs> no, he really was. I mean, I think about that. Like this guy being like, "Don't cut the canvas," you know. <laughs> like, serious. But it looks like. <laughs> like it's it's biomorphic. It's like a weird. It's like it's like this higher dimensional being. It's so strange. Yeah, it's just, I mean, this, this painting to me is so haunting. And um, there, like I have, I should have brought more painting. I have like books of his work. They're very like rare and hard to come by. Um, there's never been a monograph in English about his work. And there, a lot of the paintings, some of them are in the Art Group Museum in Lausanne and some of them are in this little museum in Lille, France, which is the one we went to. And they have them up all the time, and it's just like whoever, it's not an easy place to get to. I think Carlisle's been to Lille. I told, I was like, go see the Lesage paintings, yeah. Uh, but it's, it's not, a, it's just a strange, it's just the strangest thing. It's not, it's in the middle of nowhere. And this is so weird that he's just like a coal miner, and then he's just like, honey, I've got to go do something. <laughs> <laughs> he's like the dot matrix printer of eternity. <laughs> Oh, for, I don't, yeah, I bet. <laughs> well, I mean, this is, there's so many different talks we could go off on, but um, you, you'll know about like Cyclonopedia, the like, this is this like uh, Reza Nagarsani, this book about basically the sort of like mind behind geopolitics and like oil becomes this sort of like entity that influences history and like there's the relationship between mining and prophecy is actually something that I mm -hmm. kind of want to dive into a little more, like mm -hmm. in like, maybe grad school context because there is a like mining is a sin <laughs> you know i can't stress this enough <laughs> taking metal out of the mountain is it's is taboo for a lot of people and as soon as you do it there's like a, t a clock of how much longer can we exist you know like how much longer before we make something that is going to kill us or we pollute ourselves to death? you know it's just like sort of creates this situation like i think there's a relationship between mining and the last judgment that's like a pretty short fat line so um, <laughs> so my so I do out reverse alchemy. My meditation is I can't believe I'm sharing my meditation because I'm being filmed and like this is a very private thing. But maybe we'll all meditate on it together and bring it all down together, which is about pouring the metal back into the mountain, like reverse alchemy. <laughs> uh, yeah. Anyway. <laughs> But Swedenborg, before he started having his visions, um, worked for the Swedish government and like worked on mining. Like he was like a geo, chem, you know, like a whatever uh, geologist. And then he just suddenly started having like psychedelic visions of the infinite. And he wrote them down. Like Swedenborg wasn't an artist, but he wrote. But Blake is sort of the eye of Swedenborg in a way because he was raised. His parents were like followers of Swedenborg, and like he was raised that theology. So. A lot of the ideas of Emanuel Swedenborg come through in Blake's images. Could it also be like the isolation and alienation of like being somewhere like deep inside the human thing that could create like madness? Just like the, you know, someone's like being inside the earth and then you come out and see like that could be like a creation. Like in the mind, like if you're in the mind, definitely. Like sensory deprivation for yeah. sure. I think in Blake's case, he was just. He lived in London. He would go out and see people. He had a, you know, he lived above a hosiery shop. 
Uh, he had a, when he was young, he had a job at engraving antiquities. Like so, before photography, he would do book and illustrations, and so he was like, so like Hilma Clint, he also had this very like observational like technique behind him. But then he started the visions and stuff, and he had a wife that loved him. Like William Blake wasn't a weird loner either. Like his he, his wife Catherine, they would sit around naked in the garden and do they did sex magic. Like William Blake is a you should get into William. But, um, <laughs> uh, but like, yeah, and he, sh and, and he really wanted children, and she couldn't have children, and he was like, can I get a concubine? And she said, no, and then that was the end of it. <laughs> but that was something that you could do in the Swedenborg church, which was considered really, like, feminist and progressive at the time, because before that, you would just ma like, you would divorce your wife that couldn't reproduce, but this is, a, this is like, okay, we can just add people, <laughs> which is weird to think about, but yeah. Um, yeah, so I feel like, I mean, for Blake, the city itself was like holy, like London itself, like the fourfold vision of Jerusalem, like gets points, and they're like real points in London, they're like corresponding with these like astral points and that like whole like weird gleaming, you know, multifaceted thing he was describing was like mapped right onto the city. And like that's, so he's like the urban, he's like an urban mystic. And I, I, I love that because it's like, just as, it's like, you know, Helma of Clinton had some, she's in Stockholm, but she's also like complete, she's just like in her room all the time. You just imagine her being like very internal. Um, and it's not necessarily, like there's not necessarily this, you know, the same situation for everyone here. Yeah, you ever just walk around and see the gleaming facets of eternity just over Portland, spiritual Portland? <laughs> We should make a show. We should get a Netflix show. Okay. Yeah. Well, alternative to Portland, yeah. <laughs> oh, let's stop looking at that. Cool. Oh, yeah. I'd just like to point out that there must be a strong correlation between channeling and noise music. And Vern is going to do a performance uh, in about 15 minutes, so I encourage everyone to stick around for a bolo set, uh, impro improvisational electronic noise ambient drum. I'm not sure how you'd describe it today. That but seems accurate. Okay. <laughs> um, so, yeah, stick around, uh, have some more coffee. There's also kombucha and orange juice if anyone is thirsty. Thank you so much, Emily. That was amazing. <laughs>